I'm Tony Patterson and I work for the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. I'm based at the South Johnson Research Facility in North Queensland. And the topic I am presenting is on how to manage fusarium wilt. This has been the work of a large collaborative project looking at fusarium wilt tropical racefall research in Australia. It is the work of many people and I'm very grateful for their input. The work is very Australian centric and focused on our work here in Australia. It is not meant to be prescriptive, but it's just to give a few ideas of how to manage fusarium wilt. As how fusarium wilt is managed, I would firstly like to give some context to our knowledge, perceptions and scenarios around the disease. Next, I would like to briefly highlight management in the absence of fusarium wilt. Then I would like to discuss what happens when fusarium wilt becomes an epidemic and it is necessary to get back into production. I would like to spend the last part of this presentation discussing what banana growers can do and how we are assisting banana growers in Australia to slow the development of the disease. I don't believe there is a quick fix solution to the problem. Moreover, Banana fusarium wilt should be managed using an integrated approach where farm practices change as the scenarios being faced by banana growers change. As we know, TR4, tropical race 4 fusarium wilt, is spreading globally causing devastation to plantations and livelihoods around the world. However, in Southeast Asia, Banana growers and researchers have been dealing with the disease for more than 20 years and have developed some quite innovative production systems. A lot of work has been done on studying the infection process, such as the work of Nolene Warman and Liz Aitken, which was reported in the Frontiers of Microbiology. We know the fungus moves into the roots and then makes its way through to the xylem tissue with an abundance of chlamydospores being produced when the tissue senesces. However, there seems to be this polarised view of how the disease progresses going from a healthy plantation and then once it is infected it immediately progresses to an epidemic. It can certainly happen that way and there are numerous cases where this has occurred, but it doesn't have to progress like that. What I would like you to consider is what happens after the first infection is detected. As this scenario presented on the screen, we can see a few plants that are infected, but what about this plant or this plant? Are they uninfected, asymptomatic, or maybe even tolerant. If we have a closer look from a biosecurity perspective, if the plant does not have FOC, then it is uninfected. But if the plant does have FOC it isn't, and it is not showing symptoms, we call it asymptomatic. This is the way we're looking at, at it from a plant pathologist perspective to manage the disease and asymptomatic plants can be a real problem. But I'd like you to consider an agronomic perspective. If the plant does not have FOC, it is still uninfected, but from a production point of view, the plant may be showing tolerance to the disease. What do I mean by tolerance? For tolerance, I'm using the definition of Raberg et al. 2007 from their science paper. In this they presented four scenarios where there were different responses according to a parasite burden and which we also could call inoculum and they compared this to symptom de development which they turned around to be host health. In scenario A they compared two different groups. The red one was more resistant than the blue but they had similar tolerance. In scenario B was where the red and blue lines had similar resistance but the blue line was more tolerant than the red. 
we will come back to this scenario. The third scenario is where the red and blue lines have different resistance and tolerance. And the fourth scenario is when the red and blue lines have the same resistance and tolerance but start at a different host health status because of some other predisposing factors. What I am concentrating on is this scenario B where the individuals have the same resistance such as a banana clone and how we can make them more tolerant to the disease. This is not resistance. If the parasite burden or inoculum becomes too high then they will still show signs of, of the disease and show symptoms and a decline in, soil, in health. It just takes longer to get there. Tolerance in plants can come in many sorts of forms such as plant media, mediated tolerance or it can be mediated through microbial activity and I've listed a few examples on the screen. But what happens when we lose soil microbial activity? This is the question that my colleagues from the University of Queensland, Paul Dennis and Henry Burt, investigated. They added FOC to sterilise soil and fresh soil and measured its abundance 21 days later. They found a small increase in the FOC in the fresh soil, but a 2,500 fold increase in the FAC DNA copies in the sterile soil. My colleague from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, Hazel Garza, repeated this concept but used a susceptible plant in a pot experiment and got the same response. The disease was much more severe in the sterile soil than in the fresh soil. And this indicates that soil microorganisms actively compete with Fusarium, reducing its dominance. The plants were still infected but did not show any external symptoms. What we need to do is pull our current knowledge of disease and growth of plants together to determine the critical control points where we can intervene with management. If we look at our current commercial banana production systems used in many places around the world it hasn't changed for nearly a hundred years. So let us start in this case with an infected crop that is no longer economically viable. This is removed and the land fallowed for a period before being replanted to bananas. We hope that during this process we reduce our FOC inoculum and this should allow the plants to survive to produce as many continuous returns to maximise production before it becomes reinfected. But it doesn't always work and it, the plants get reinfected very early. Therefore, our management product, banana production systems need to be redesigned, requiring a paradigm shift in how we grow plants. As Albert Einstein is quoted in saying, insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. Yet, that is exactly what we do, with maybe a few minor tweaks to the products that we apply. What is required is a redesign in our banana production systems, which can look very complicated and messy, as there are many facets to growing bananas. By doing this, we come back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation. There is no single solution banana fusarium wilt and fusarium wilt management requires an integrated strategy of solutions for the different scenarios faced by banana growers. So let's move to those scenarios. The first scenario faced by banana growers is the absence of fusarium wilt. In North Queensland this is the majority of farms. Then we have the first incidence of fusarium wilt and very low infection rates. Again in North Queensland there are five farms that are now facing this scenario. Then we have the disease reaching the epidemic stage and the growers need to hit the reset button and start again. This is the scenario being faced by banana growers in the Northern Territory of Australia. 
We'll now deal with each one of these scenarios one at a time. By looking at the first scenario where banana growers are free from the disease, the emphasis should be on biosecurity and remaining disease free for as long as possible. By implementing good on-farm biosecurity, crop management can largely focus on production. On-farm biosecurity is a separate presentation in itself. However, I'd like to go over just a few key points. Nguyen et al. wrote a paper in Plant Disease about testing the efficacy of different disinfectants. This information is being used for vehicle washdowns and foot baths. But as footwear can be a pathway to the introduction of the disease, many farms have introduced boot exchange stations where only clean, dirt-free footwear can be worn onto the farm. The footwear is still treated with the disinfectant as an added precaution. Furthermore, many of the banana farms in Queensland are using zoning and develop exclusion zones to help separate people and only those that must really enter into the farm are permitted entry. For more information on Fusarium wilt, it can be found at this web address on your screen or type Panama TR4 Queensland into a search engine to find all the resources available for growers, including videos, information kits and checklists. I would like to now move on to the final scenario where the disease becomes an epidemic and growers are facing a wipeout. In this case, resistance is crucial to getting back into production. We have seen this used successfully in the Philippines with the deployment of GCTCV 218. However, in the Australian production system, there is a penalty associated with many of the currently available resistant cultivars. There are many ways of getting resistance into Cavendish bananas, like somaclonal variations, development of hybrids, genetic modification, and now gene editing. However, these all have a long lead and development time. The method we are using in Australia is through mutation breeding by starting with a resistant cultivars and selecting for improved agronomic characteristics. Over the past five years, we have used five banana cultivars and have selected around 50 lines with improved characteristics compared to their parents and none have shown symptoms of TR4 expression. There is still a lot of testing and selection required, but it is hoped that we will have commercial cultivars with some resistance and no production penalties suitable for the North Queensland environment available within the next few years when they are most required by banana growers. I would now like to move on to what is really the second scenario being faced by banana growers, which is around the first incursion of the disease and preventing it from reaching that epidemic phase for as long as possible. I believe this is where farm management decisions can have the greatest impact. I'd like to spend a bit more time discussing the different management options and the research we have been doing in Australia. Firstly, starting with crop destruction. There are currently very strict regulations around infected plants. Any confirmed cases lead to the plants being destroyed and the plant material in the area around the plant are fumigated using urea applied at one kilogram per meter squared. In a laboratory assay conducted by David East, he found that urea was very efficacious in killing the pathogen. An ammonia level of 2,500 parts per million was required to be generated for it to be effective. In a field experiment, Wayne O'Neill found a similar result with race one, that urea by itself was effective at reducing the amount of inoculum in the soil relative 
to an untreated control. It didn't eliminate the pathogen, but it significantly reduced it. When I previously depicted the banana cropping system, I showed a bare soil. The work we have been doing in Australia has been looking at the role of non-banana plants in the management of the disease. And they can be either deleterious, promote the disease, or beneficial in suppressing the disease. In our production systems, we want to reduce the FOC inoculum levels in the soil. We also want to increase the beneficial organisms that are antagonistic to the pathogen. Therefore, we need to understand the role non-banana plants have as alternative hosts which may carry infection through to the next crops. We also need to know what we can grow as rotation crops to get the greatest reduction in FOC inoculum and foster those beneficial organisms. And following planting, we need to know what we can grow as vegetative ground covers to stimulate and encourage beneficial organisms to keep a continuously returning production system going for as long as possible. To determine the alternative host status of fusarium on bananas, we conducted multi-location field surveys of infected banana fields looking for different races of the pathogen. The surveys were conducted in three different production regions with distinct geographical characteristics. The frequently identified plants from the field surveys were included in inoculated glasshouse experiments which tested over 50 different potential alternative host species. From the glasshouse experiments conducted, all races of FOC could be recovered from the different plants, but some plants were found to be better hosts than others. Jay Anderson, who is part of Liz Aitken's team at the University of Queensland, additionally investigated colonisation of alternative hosts using a GFP modified subtropical race 4. Jay found limited colonisation of the roots by the fungus, finding occasional hyphal nets, chlamydospores and some colonisation of epidermal cells. However, when Jay treated the plants with herbicides, the GFP fusarium was able to extensively colonise the dead weeds with mass sporulation occurring. From the work that has been done on alternative hosts, a grower's guide has been produced. The guide gives some basic information like name, location, description and a rating based on glasshouse results and whether it has been isolated from the field or not. The aim is to give growers some idea of the potential host status of the different weeds and whether they are likely to carry the disease over to the next banana crop. We can also consider non-banana plants as rotation crops to reduce inoculum and increase antagonistic organisms. In a glasshouse experiment using a method developed by Wayne O'Neill, we call pots in pots experiment, which is depicted in the figure across the top, we tested a range of potential rotation crops. The recovery of, of subtropical race 4 was compared in relation to our inoculated and non-inoculated banana controls and was giving a range of responses. Some crops, like peanuts and brassicas, appear to be good hosts to FOC. There are many intermediate hosts, but we found four species that had a similar recovery of FOC to the uninoculated banana control, such as Dallas grass, Queensland blue cooch, burgundy bean and lachina. These are worthy of further investigation. In a field experiment conducted by Shao Mintoff and his team in the Northern Territory, several potential rotation crops for the region were tested. I'm only presenting the results from four treatments, a weedy fallow, which was our control, cavalcade, Centrosema pascorum, jarrahgrass, Digitaria meligiana, and sugar graze, a forage sorghum. 
Zhao used a method developed in a previous project to measure the FOC TR4 DNA based on a TACMAN assay. The samples corresponded to the previous crop of infected bananas, the rotation period when different crops were grown, and the subsequent banana crop following the rotation. And there was very little difference and it certainly wasn't significant in the TR4 DNA recovered from the soil between the different treatments and between the different phases in the crop cycle. However, there were differences in the disease incidence determined by the external expression of the disease in the subsequent banana crops. If we use the weedy fallow as our reference, there was a rapid increase in symptoms 21 weeks after planting, reaching around 40% at the harvest of the plant crop. Cavalcade was significantly slower to express the symptoms and had 20% expression by harvest. The jarrah grass was more rapid, reaching 50% and the sugar graze intermediate. While the rotation crops didn't reduce the pathogen in the soil, as all treatments were equally infected, the cavalcade did slow the expression of the disease. From some earlier work which I published with Emily Rames, we found that when vegetative ground covers were maintained around the base of plants, there was a reduction in the amount of necrotic tissue within the banana pseudostem. Although the plants were still infected, necrosis was significantly reduced over three crop cycles. Associated with the reduction in pseudostem discoloration was an increase in fungal richness under the vegetated ground cover treatment over that same period. Fungal richness was also found to be associated with activity of the enzyme beta-glucosidase so that an increase in fungal richness was highly correlated with increasing beta-glucosidase. And both an increase in beta-glucosidase and fungal richness were strongly correlated with a decrease in pseudostem discoloration using a 1 to 6 scale. Some preliminary results from a second field experiment conducted in North Queensland used Illumina Next Generation Sequencing to track changes over a four-year period in a field experiment. In this case, we used the number of Fusarium oxysporum OTUs as a surrogate to FOC because of the quarantine restrictions on working with Fusarium wilt in Queensland. Following establishment of the treatments, there was an increase in Fusarium oxysporums in the bare soil, the silver line, compared with the vegetated ground cover treatment the yellow line. At around 36 months, the three year period after planting, there was a significant increase in the abundance of Fusarium oxysporum OTUs in the bare soil, which declined at around 42 months. At around the 31 month period after planting, there were very serious unfavorable climatic conditions. Firstly, heavy saturating rain followed a few weeks later by extremely hot, dry conditions. And we will be investigating further the impact of those climatic extremes leading to the dominance of Fusarium oxysporins in the soil, but also the buffering effect created by ground cover. History of nitrogen applications also seems to be an important factor in the development and expression of Fusarium wilt. Susceptible bananas inoculated with FOC and grown in soils that had a history of different nitrogen applications showed differences in disease expressions. In this case, nearly 40% of the rhizome was necrotic in plants grown in soils that had a history of high nitrogen application, whereas only 15% of rhizome necrosis was measured in soils with a lower nitrogen application. The work with Paul Dennis and Henry Bird on soil microbial communities alluded to bacterial community differences in soils with high and low nitrogen applications. My colleague David East has also been looking at the role of biological controls. In this case, he tested a trichoderma isolate 
against race one in a pot experiment and found it significantly reduced disease expression and rhizome discoloration. By measuring the DNA of the pathogen and the biocontrol, Hazel Garza showed that Fusarium has the upper hand in the soil. However, in the plant, in the rhizome and pseudostem tissue, the trichoderma was recovered in greater abundance and the Fusarium reduced. I have highlighted how, if we are to manage Fusarium wilt, we need to consider the different scenarios being faced by banana growers in relation to the disease. Do they have the disease? Is, it, is the disease at low incidence? Or has the disease become an epidemic? This will dictate the most appropriate management strategies. What I have presented and discussed could be presented in a structural form. In the absence of the disease, management should focus on biosecurity. Following the first incursion, there are many many grower management decisions which influence the advance of the disease such as crop destruction and the management of non-banana plants as alternative hosts, rotation crops or ground covers. Furthermore, nitrogen applications and biocontrols can also be considered as important management considerations. When the disease becomes an epidemic, then we need to consider the role of cultivar replacement. So in conclusion, I hope I have demonstrated how banana fusarium wilt should be managed using an integrated approach where farm practices change as the disease situation changes. In the absence of fusarium wilt, the emphasis should be on remaining disease free. Following the first incursion, inoculum management is crucial and increasing plant tolerance to prolong the time for as long as possible until that epidemic phase is realised. When the incidence becomes an epidemic, then cultivar change is required. To finish up, I would like to acknowledge the people who have contributed to this work. And this is just some of them from a meeting held early in the project. And I apologise for not mentioning everybody's names that contributed. I would also like to acknowledge the agencies for which they work for, which included state governments and universities collaborating together. And I would particularly like to thank the funding agencies that contributed, notably the Queensland Government, Hort Innovation and the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. And finally, a big thank you to the organisers of this forum to allow me to present the work that we have been doing in Australia and I hope you have picked up something from these presentations. So from me, thank you very much and best wishes.